One last show in a sordid supper club in Biloxi, Mississippi, for a measly $2,000. A ratty dressing room, a crumpled costume, a blonde wig. Exhausted, she heads back to the shabby motel where her three children are crowded into a single bed. In the morning. It is around 10.30 when she finally rolls out of town on Highway 90. At 2 a.m. on June 29, 1967, her Buick Electra plows into a tractor trailer. The woman with an incredible lust for life receives the kiss of death. Hollywood star, the buxom and beautiful Jane Mansfield, is dead. She was killed instantly when the car she was riding in collided with a truck a few miles from New Orleans early this morning. Early this morning. When rescue crews find a blonde wig wedged into the windshield, they assume the passenger was decapitated. Sam, her last lover, also dies in the crash. The actress's three children survive, along with two of her four dogs. Not until they open her purse do the police realize the victim's name, Jane Mansfield. She hasn't been in the headlines for quite some time. Back in LA, she liked to amble through Memorial Park Cemetery, which she called the most peaceful place in Hollywood. Her true blue friends have a plaque erected there that perpetuates a white lie. Jane Mansfield, 1938-1967. Vera Palmer was actually born in 1933. On July 3rd, she is laid to rest by her family in Pennsylvania. Vera Palmer, that was her real name. A throng of curious onlookers watch her second husband, the ever faithful Mick, weeping over a casket swathed in pink and white roses. Jane Mary, the 17-year-old daughter who was removed from the star's custody a month earlier, is allowed to attend the funeral. But her younger children, Mariska, Zoltan, and Miklos, are still hospitalized. You'll rock and roll yourself to the happiest time of your life. Here she is, the actress known as the Blonde Bombshell. And man, oh man, oh Mansfield. Jane Mansfield, that is. The Hollywood Jane broke into in the 1950s was a sepia-colored world bathed in washed-out images. Then Jane became a star and played out the rest of her career in Technicolor. The night before she died, Jane urged her secretary to write a script based on her life story. She wanted to star in a movie that showed the real Jane Mansfield. But who can bring Jane to life on the big screen? A star from the 60s resurrected in the reality TV age. It's just absolutely great being a star. Being a star. And so, one sunny day in February 2014, two dozen actresses show up at Westfield Studios in Los Angeles. Each one hopes to make her dream come true, to become a Hollywood star. Okay, I'm going to ask you what's your name, please. Jane Mansfield. And what's your real name? <laughs> Cassidy Lee Parker. My name is Darby Riles. My name is Natina Schneider. I'm originally from Hawaii. They live in Los Angeles, but hail from cities like Austin and Orlando and Pittsburgh. My name is Anastasia Nova. I'm Danelle Ice. Hannah Peppa. Sarah Malone. They're brunette, blonde, redheaded, but all have dug deep <laughs> to find ties with Jane. <laughs> Sorry. Brooke Flint. My name is Tabor Cross, and I come from California, Los Angeles, California. 
Jane was an East Coast girl, born into a middle-class family headed by her attorney father. But she grew up in Texas. Jane was never a rebel. Like thousands of American girls, she dreamed of becoming the next Shirley Temple. It wasn't poverty that drove Jane to Los Angeles. She was drawn there by just one thing, Hollywood. She was determined to have a movie career. Jane Mansfield. At age 17, Vera Palmer marries the young Paul Mansfield and changes her name. Jane Mansfield is born. The couple soon moves to Los Angeles with their three-year-old daughter, Jane Mary, in tow. Jane answers countless casting calls, trembling with fear. Like all newcomers, She's afraid of overly friendly directors and their badgering assistants and the inevitable casting couch. She's living alone in LA while her husband serves a two-year army stint in Korea. Paul left behind a modest brunette. When he returns, he finds a platinum blonde bombshell. Paul can't handle the change. The couple separates, Paul goes back to Dallas. She was like a, a classical guitar. She was beautiful, perfect, and real. I've never seen anybody who has such an incredible body. Um, it was out of this world. Bigger up here, very small down here, and she was just carried herself so perfectly. Massive, massive cans, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> They were out all the time. <laughs> you don't come across a body like that very often. Her first year in town, Jane gets her foot in Hollywood's door. She wins a couple of beauty contests and a few bit parts. She lands her first movie role in Female Jungle, where she plays a nymphomaniac called Candy Price. Variety magazine, The Hollywood Bible, cruelly quips that Jane looks like the understudy of a Marilyn Monroe impersonator. She's a man crazy but when Jane sees herself on screen, she's delighted by her new image. On the next film stage, Marilyn Monroe, already a big star, is filming her famous scene in The Seven Year Itch. The two actresses won't cross paths at the studio, or ever. In 1955, Warner Brothers signs Jane to a six-month contract at $250 a week. She gives herself three years to become famous and another two to win an Oscar. But Jane's dreams will never come true. She'll be hurt that Hollywood never appreciates her for anything but her voluptuous curves. My measurements are 36, 24, 38. Well, my bra is 44 double D, uh, 38 and 48. 36, 28, 40. 36, 26, uh, 35. 32, 28, 38. 34B, 34C, a 30 double D, 30 something, 30, I don't know exactly, but we can measure. At age 21, her 41 inch bust outshines all others, especially when paired with a 21 inch waist and 35 inch hips. Good. I'm Studio bosses flaunt Jane at press parties. At Christmas, she embodies the big busted blonde on the Warner Brothers calendar. That's good, that's good, hold that. But Warner good. only gives Jane a few lines in forgettable B films. Good. A 
few months later, they loan her to Columbia for a pulp film adapted for the screen by writer David Goodis, The Burglar. Jane plays a waifish woman child and proves to be the standout of the cast. I'm only giving you advice, but you're a stubborn cut. You won't listen. Listen to you, I've got to hear a cat yelling in an alley. During the shoot, Jane is accidentally burned when a tea kettle explodes. She unabashedly shows the crew her scalded bosom. But Warner has no use for the extravagant actress. Jane takes things in hand. She dons her star costume and sunglasses, tucks her pooch under her arm, and shows up in New York to audition for a new comedy by the writer of The Seven Year Itch. She's immediately hired to play Rita Marlowe. The dumb blonde starts a new career on Broadway. Overnight, New Yorkers dub Jane the new queen of Broadway. On October 13th, 1955, she celebrates her triumph at Sardi's a hot spot reserved for the toast of the town. <laughs> that very same night, Jane gets a telegram from Fox. Learning of the play's success, producer Daryl Zanuck offers Jane a seven-year contract with 20th Century Fox. Jane does 465 shows of the Broadway play, becoming a bona fide star. The press goes wild about Jane. She appears on the cover of Life magazine twice. She's featured along with major figures like Nixon, Khrushchev, and Kennedy. but some photos also bring headaches. Back in Dallas, ex-husband Paul Mansfield files for custody of their daughter. And when the judge rebukes Jane for posing nude, she replies, guilty. It was in the February 1955 issue of Playboy. There's nothing wrong posing for a magazine. But Jane insists she posed nude to buy bread and milk for her baby. She says she became pregnant at 17 after being raped and chose Paul to be Jane Mary's father. But he isn't the girl's real dad. The judge grants the divorce and gives Jane sole custody of her daughter. Did she deserve it? Back in New York, when Jane goes out with a man, she leaves her daughter alone in the restaurant bathroom. Not exactly good mothering. The play is still running on Broadway when Jane finally shoots her first movie for Fox. Frank Tashlin is the director. They promised her a Steinbeck role, but Jane has to settle for a comedy that wins her a bright future. Her unique interpretation of the film's blonde bombshell is almost cartoonish. Oh, the little, ooh, the little, ooh, 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 like that. Jane is making $1,500 a week, but she's still doing supermarket openings and judging beauty pageants. She never has enough money to keep up her lifestyle. Especially now that she has another mouth to feed. When you're with me. Her new lover is Miklos Hargitay, a Hungarian bodybuilder turned actor. Oh, he's so big. Who was once Mr. Universe. He goes by the name of Mick, or Mickey. My hair. 
Jane steals him away from Mae West's troupe, where he's working as a dancer. She falls head over heels for his sublime muscles. He is the love of her life. Back in Los Angeles in early 1957, life with Mick is sweet and easy. Every morning, Jane drops off her daughter at school, then heads to the Fox Studios. Fox paid $100,000 to buy Jane out of the Broadway play that made her famous. Detractors call Jane a poor parody of Marilyn Monroe. It's unfair. Jane has always been true to her image. She shows just one version of herself, always smiley and happy. And she doesn't do drugs. This music brings out the Bella Ponte. In the film, she plays Rita Marlowe, a ditzy star. Jane lets people believe she's just like her character. Leave and walk out on all this publicity? And accompanying Jane on this mad world. But who is copying whom? Uh, I'm uh, Rockwell Hunter, Miss Marlowe. Rockwell Marlo. Hunter? His name sounds influential. His name only so happens to be Rockwell Hunter. What do you do? Rockwell Hunter? His name sounds influential. <laughs> His name only happens to be Rockwell Hunter. What do you do? I work for uh, LaSalle Jr., Raskin, Pooley, and Crockett. Uh, the advertising agency. Oh, those names, how crazy influential. Oh, those names, how crazy influential. He's a very big influential advertising man. That's all he is. Oh. Ooh, those names, how crazy influential. He just happens to be a very big influential advertising man. That's all he is. What do you do there? He's a very big influential advertising man. That's all he is. What do you do there? Hmm? Uh, I write TV commercials. Oh, no, TV commercials. Oh, no, I couldn't go for a guy who did that. Oh, no, I couldn't go for a guy like that. Oh, no, I, I couldn't go for a guy who did that. Could I? Back in her home in Dallas, Jane's mother, Mrs. Palmer, learns of Mick's existence as she watches TV. The proof that her daughter is really a star is right before her eyes. The afternoon of September 18, 1957, Jane shows off her new swimming pool to photographers who received a pink invitation to come drink pink champagne. Mick dug the pool himself, working for months. But at Jane's behest, he does not appear until the end of the party. Jane announces she's leaving for Europe on the promo tour for the movie version of Rock Hunter. Mick won't be going. Fox doesn't want him tagging along. He'll babysit Jane Mary instead and keep up the pool. The film producers have invested big money. Jane needs to look like an easy blonde who tantalizes men. In life for you, she first begin. You in bit stars like Cable Europe. Jane has no idea where it is. But the studio bosses promise she'll be feted there like a queen. Star status. For the first time, Jane doesn't have to carry her own bags through an airport. She finally feels like a big time star. She arrives in London looking as sultry as ever, delighting her European fans. She tells them, I love people, especially people who love me. Jane wants to be appreciated as a real actress, but her talents are obscured by her blonde bombshell persona. That's great. That's good, good, good. Hey, good I read that once you led a tiger down Sunset Boulevard 
by a pink ribbon. Is, is that true? Yes, I like pink. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to be thought of as an actress. An actress with a soul, an actress with a very human quality, rather than a mother. Is there any particular role you would like to play? Later on, I would very much like to do the role of Blanche Dubois in the streetcar named Desire. Like Marilyn Monroe, who recently left Hollywood to take on more serious roles, Jane sees herself as an intellectual. She's bent on appearing in Tennessee Williams' play, A Streetcar Named Desire. In Paris, the studio makes sure her fans turn out. A self-assured Jane tells reporters she'd like to meet Jean-Paul Sartre and Juliette Greco. She says she's into philosophy and claims to read Montaigne and Voltaire in French. She chides disbelieving reporters by telling them she can even play Paganini and Rachmaninoff concertos. the studio heads realize that Jane is her own best PR agent. The girls who answer our casting call know the key to Jane's allure was her walk. Hips swaying, bosom pushed out, lips pursed. How did she walk? What a girl has to do for her career. Yeah, her head was kind of always up. If you have a good figure, why not take advantage of it? I don't know. I guess like, like that. Very powerful. Sometimes she had a little bit of a, <laughs> it depend if she went faster. <laughs> Everything was from her hips. And she was walking on her tippy toes. Very small steps. Brooke, Alexi, Natina, Sarah, Mika, Daniel, Anastasia, Cassidy, Darby, Tabor, Anna. But what did Jane have that they don't? She was very proper. Like, she was, like, very, like, pretty and very nice. And she was, like... Her body, she was holding her body very well. She seemed to always have like her stomach sucked in and her chest out and very um, feminine. In Paris, Jane makes appearance after appearance under the watchful eye of Fox press agent Bill Winter. Jane is draped in jewelry on loan from the producer and the clothes her character wore in the movie. At dinner parties, she asks wives if they'd like her to take care of their husbands, setting off knowing laughter. She wins over new fans. When newspapers make nasty comments or caricaturize Jane pointing her derriere at the camera, she retorts that as long as they spell her name right, nothing else matters. Hollywood has taught her that much. During the drawn-out press tour, she decides to marry Mick, a decision that helps Jane block out her exhaustion, aching back and sore feet. Jane is one big walking advertisement on permanent display. 
From her bra supplied by Playtex to the girdle that accentuates her tiny waist from Spirella, down to her stockings from Dupont de Nemours. She visits 13 countries in 33 days, graciously posing for photo shoots in some outlandish spots. Italy goes wild for Jane. In the land of stormy brunettes, the bright and breezy blonde sets men on fire. She will always feel warmly appreciated by her Italian fans. Quando penso al tuo sorriso, io dimentico. In Rome, she watches Fellini's masterpiece, La Dolce Vita. She wishes she were Anita Ekberg, frolicking in the Trevi Fountain. She's dying for a role like that. When Jane reenacts the famous scene from La Dolce Vita, the Italian press eats it up. In the mayhem, someone steals $1,000 from Jane. Bill Winter has to wrestle her away from overexcited fans. It's the start of a long string of scandals and scuffles. Torn dresses, ripped bodices. Jane drives crowds wild, and wild crowds get her equally wound up. Still, she's determined to shed her pinup girl image and win real respect as an actress. Jane is 25 years old. The Steinbeck power, the Steinbeck passion. After the triumphant press tour, Fox starts production on its adaptation of Steinbeck's novel, The Wayward Bus. Jane plays Camille, a disenchanted starlet. You're a sale, so am I. We both know what the score is, it's even. Her handlers try to talk Jane out of doing the low-budget black and white film, where she's part of an ensemble cast. Maybe she should have stayed on that path, as the film brought Jane her only real award the 1957 Golden Globe for Best New Star. Thanks to the award, as Christmas approaches, Jane is invited to join some Hollywood greats. This time, her loving Mick goes along. The stars head to Korea to entertain US troops, the way Marilyn did four years earlier. But the camera never warms up to Jane. The images are cold. Even the soldiers look bored. It's nothing like the famous images of Marilyn Monroe thrilling the troops. But unlike Miss Monroe, Jane doesn't want to marry a millionaire or a baseball star or an intellectual. All she wants is to marry Mick. Hollywood movie producers stage storybook romances for their starlets. Fox threatens to drop Jane but she convinces them to accept the marriage. In the land of make-believe, she wants a real-life marriage. Jane wears a flounced white lace gown. Mick is in a red and black mohair tuxedo. None of her fellow stars show up, not Liz Taylor or Marilyn or Kate Hepburn. With his skin-tight shirts and broken English, Mick isn't socially acceptable. But Jane dismisses their scorn with superb indifference. You don't let a guy as manly as Mick get away. To cement their newfound bliss, Jane buys the Pink Palace, a sprawling mansion on Sunset Boulevard. The house has eight bedrooms and 12 bathrooms and costs over $300,000. Jane repaints the house pink. She sees it as a good investment in self-promotions. Reporters will be able to snap great photos there. Sweet. 
Today, there's nothing left of the Pink Palace. It has been torn down. The mansion becomes a financial sinkhole. To bankroll her lifestyle, Jane strikes new advertising deals. $5,000 in cash and $5,000 in merchandise. She peddles herself to the firms that fit out her house. She makes supermarket appearances. She wears dresses that show off her cleavage, her only big draw in the eyes of the organizers of these CD shows. Well, that looks great. But Jane remains incredibly popular. She's conscientious and receptive to fans, and she never tires of signing autographs. Send me more pictures, she tells her agents. There must be somebody out there who doesn't have one yet. I like to play women who know what they want. That's why I like Jane Mansfield, though, because she knew what she wanted and she had a lot of ways to get it. I love dogs. The actress that portrays her, I think, has to... It can't just be about the sex, because she was also a passionate, loving woman as well. I love children. We're very similar. I look similar to her. I love men. <laughs> and also, as I got older, I used to get told that I resembled her. Well, the hair. <laughs> um, I love the style. And also, I have an hourglass figure that she is very well known for. So that's why. I love her, I can embrace her, and I, I know I have the curves for it. I know that's not all she was, but... The Cannes Film Festival still gives Jane a warm welcome. Organizers fight over the extravagant star. She always draws photographers and throngs of gawkers. I would love to have known her. I'm connected to her. I feel connected to her. I feel like I was part of her. There's something about her. Wow, I have to do this. Never tiring of the tours and tributes, Jane says yes to everything. One day she's judging Miss Orchid, Miss Tomato, Miss Nylon. The next week she's at Cannes. <laughs> Today's starlets look up to actresses like Meryl Streep, Julia Roberts, and Sandra Bullock. Stars whose appearances are rare and always carefully negotiated and timed. Jane is the polar opposite. She shrewdly plays on her Hollywood character. But is she letting her chance to become a real actress slip away? Back from Cannes, she surprises Hollywood gossips by simply vanishing. She hides away in the Pink Palace. Then, on December 21st, 1958, in Santa Monica, she gives birth to a boy named Miklos, in tribute to mixed Hungarian parents. Jane gives her husband a gold bracelet with the inscription, chained to you for all time. Jane's contract is dropped by Fox, which hopes to sign Marilyn Monroe. The studio can't pimp out its dumb blonde anymore. The couple has no income. Jane tries to spark Hollywood's pity, pretending she's sold off all her furniture and sleeps on a mattress on the bare floor. She doesn't know how to rekindle her career. All I do is casting. This is what I focus all my time on. This is all I want in the world. This is all I do. This is it. You never know, 20 years from now, you never know what people will love. I really care about like the craft of acting and I'll say, you know, it's not because I want to be famous. I still would love to be famous. <laughs> I will go for auditions I'm not supposed to because I just don't care. I go for auditions where I'm supposed to be perhaps 21 because I don't care, because I want the part. And sometimes they'll cast me because I take a chance, I take a risk, because I have life and I go, because I want it. I go for anything. I'll be in a monkey suit. I don't care. Because if I'm acting, I do it. I don't care. Jane gets back on track with an old trick, the bursting bra number. 
crowds go wild when her bra hooks pop. Jane pretends to be surprised and embarrassed. Her cleavage is her bigger asset. But Jane makes her real comeback in a Vegas nightclub. She rakes in $12,500 a week, 10 times more than Fox paid her. The high point of the show is a Marilyn hit. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss, kiss on the, the hand. hand. Maybe be quite, quite continental. But diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> a kiss might be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your home flat. Or help you at the automatic men grow cold. As girls grow old, and we all lose our charms in the end. <laughs> but wear cut or pear shape, these rocks won't lose their shape. Diamonds are the girl's, girl's best, best friend. friend. <laughs> but Hollywood has lost interest in pinup girls. Jane's dream of winning an Oscar slips away. Even Marilyn will never win more than a Golden Globe. Jane seemed resigned to her fate. Mick has become just another sad, dull husband who goes to bed early and is up with the sun, her children's babysitter. But Jane wants a man who fulfills her. At night, she needs to go out and be seen. I have three children, and she had a lot of children, and her dream was always to be a star. And she had to balance that with her strong desires to be a mother and to be a wife. You know, I'm a, I'm a single mom, you know, I'm a mom, and I'm an actress, and I, I take care of my son, and I act. She's a very good example of how a woman can juggle both her career and her home life. I want my children to grow up knowing me, not mommy who goes on location and comes home twice a year to visit us, but we always stay together as a family. When you're a famous sought-after actor, Los Angeles is the greatest city in the world. But when you're down and out, it's a nightmare. After a night as a castaway on a desert One morning in February 1962, the Coast Guard discovers two sun-scorched people on a tiny atoll in the Bahamas. They're terrified after spotting sharks nearby. It's Jane and Mick. Their boat sunk the night before. They clung to the reef all night as the waves crashed over them. The disbelieving press accuses the couple of staging a pathetic publicity stunt. Something the popular actress vigorously denies. Jane blames Mick for the fiasco, accusing him of trying to destroy her career. On May 3rd, 1962, Jane announces she's getting divorced. Mick leaves the house, suitcase in hand. The next morning, he comes back. The media rush in. Yesterday, why the public announcement yesterday? Why did you fire? I think Mickey can explain that better than I. Well, Jane would do a much better job and a much better way she can conduct herself if she didn't have a very of the children. Jane, when you come out one day and you say you're going to get a divorce, and the next day you say you're not going to. It came it came to a complete head. Under the circumstances, don't you both face being charged with a publicity stunt, really? It looks that way. I mean, it hasn't been 24 hours since the other announcement came out. Jane calls two press conferences in two days, first telling reporters they're splitting up, then announcing they're getting back together. This time, the worn-out soap opera has gone too far. A film shoot awaits Jane at Cinecita. She tells Mick the time apart will help solve their problems. Men have always dreamed of sleeping with Jane, who claims she's never been unfaithful. But that summer, 
She heads to Italy and leaves the kids behind with Mick, distracting herself with booze and casual encounters. Fascinated by her prominent breasts and erotic poses, thousands of Italians brush up against Jane, openly fondling her. On this night, she falls fast and hard for her Italian producer, Enrico Bomba. She hopes he can straighten out her ridiculously muddled life. Jane thinks Bamba will be her mentor, that she'll be able to launch a new career at his side. But Bamba forgets to mention that he's already married. With Mick sent packing by Jane, the pink palace is crumbling. Mick is the one who repaired the plumbing and cleaned the cars. When Christmas 1962 rolls around, Jane finds herself alone in her mansion. She calls her husband, who comes running back. The soap opera continues. I felt that I, I wanted to reconcile with Mickey very much. So I called him. I wanted to call him that night, but decided to wait till the next morning just to make sure. Mickey, is this correct? That's what the lady said. And if the lady says it, it must be right, huh? Well, you said it, yeah. Right. <laughs> no, I just spaghetti and the pizza recipes and get out the goulash. <laughs> And so it goes with all great loves. The lovers can't live with or without each other. So they tear each other apart. Marilyn Monroe dies on August 5th, 1962. Her passing is the death knell of old Hollywood. The blonde bombshell era is over. America becomes fascinated with a new feminine ideal, embodied by a slender and elegant brunette, Jackie Kennedy. Jane isn't even 30 yet. She lets herself go. She has three more babies. She puts on weight. She starts doing drugs. She floats from fling to fling. She sparks scandals and flaunts her nude body publicly. She tells the world that her new lover, Nelson Sardelli, is a wild man in bed, and that former lover, Enrico Bomba, gave her orgasms that were both heaven and hell. I like sex, she says. It's a gift from God. It's the first time a mainstream star appears nude on screen. For years, Jane has hesitated to shed her clothes for unrated movies. She knows she has to make a choice, display her talent or her body. But does she really have a choice? She silences detractors by saying the only complaints she's received are people complaining the scene isn't long enough. The rawest images are already being sold in sex shops. During a trip to Budapest to visit Mick's family, Jane announces that she's pregnant again. The baby appears out of thin air. But who is the real father? Is it Mick, or her Italian lover, Bamba, or the young Brazilian, Nelson Sardelli? On January 23rd, 1964, surrounded by Mick and her three children, Jane gives birth to Mariska. Our actresses try to convince us they can play the role, depicting Jane's pleasures and pains. But for them, it's just one more casting call. Do any of them really love Jane? But if 
if I want to, I do it. And I want to. In April 1964, Jane makes good on her desire to become a full-fledged actress. In the outskirts of New York, she rehearses the play Bus Stop, which inspired the Marilyn Monroe film. The director is one Matt Simber, born Vitale Ottaviano. It's love at first sight. A lover as gorgeous as a Greek god, a genius, she says. She continues her Pygmalion transformation at his side, like Sophia Loren with Carlo Ponti. And yet, Jane takes off for the Riviera with Mick, before the premiere of Bus Stop. Mick is her chauffeur, her butler, the one who picks Jane up when she's drop dead drunk. The one who takes care of her children while she poses for gawkers of every ilk. Every night, with a sad Mick looking on, she phones Matt Simber. Before Simber has her tackle Shakespeare, he sends Jane out on tours where she plays roles that brought Marilyn Monroe fame. After bus stop, she stars in Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Three months later, Jane marries her director. I met so many. Jane still loves being a mother. In October 1965, she gives birth to Matt's son, Antonio Rafael. Jane has five children with three different fathers. She's a woman staunchly ahead of her time. But the last pregnancy leaves Jane worn out. She spends hours in front of the mirror looking for signs of aging. She tries new creams to keep her changing body young. She has a hard time squeezing into her dresses. After bleaching her hair for so many years, it starts falling out. She wears beehive wigs that make her look like a pudgy crossdresser. Jane guzzles LSD-laced champagne. She lets herself go, becoming a slatternly mess. And yet she continues performing for a public still eager to watch Jane take off her clothes. Spaced out on drugs, she claims to be hounded by the devil. She has debilitating panic attacks. Jane teeters on the edge of madness. When you get older as an actress, all of this that you used to walk in the door, because I use that as well, to, then that's why I'm connected. You walk in the door, you have all this, and then all of a sudden, you have it, but it's gone away. It's not what it used to be. You can't be that ingenue that you used to be. So I understand. So all of a sudden, you might want to take it. I don't do that, but because you know that can happen. You start drinking, perhaps, and then you lose it even more. I think she was happy because she was doing what she loved. But then there was this darkness, which a lot of entertainers have. Darkness inside that you cannot explain. It's there. And you have to have that to, to, be, to act, to bring it out. If you don't have that darkness and the light, In late 1966, 20th Century Fox brings in Jane for a two-minute role, a bombshell caricature. It will be her final movie.
Jane's last lover, Sam Brody, clings to her side. Brody is a violent man who abandoned his handicapped wife and two children. He accompanies her everywhere. He's the one who looks after her pooches now. It is 1967. Jane has only a few more months to live. She makes her final club tour in the backlands of England. Under the table. Did you catch this? Yeah. Three dancers, a shabby dressing room. People still come out to glimpse the symbol of old Hollywood. Jane forgets her gowns at the hotel, goes on stage late. Sometimes she can't even do her show when Brody has left her black and blue. It's time for Jane to say goodbye to the stage. She's still popular, but as a curiosity from a bygone era, an attraction, a pinup girl. When Jane gets back to the US, social services remove Jane Mary from her custody after the girl accuses Sam Brody of beating her. I don't want to end up an outdated old biddy, Jane used to say. When I feel like my time's over, I'll shut myself up at home and wait for Satan's kiss. On June 29th, 1967, at 2 a.m., fate puts Jane in the path of a tractor trailer that brings her story to a close.